I'm happy to welcome you this evening to our educational presentation titled Policies That Ensure Safe and Supportive Schools for LGBTQ plus and all students. Um, the presentation is being delivered um, by a couple of representatives from Equality California, which has been working hard to transform our school systems to be safer and more supportive of LGBTQ students and all students really. Um, and so we're really excited to have um, Chris Negri here tonight. Um, and he's brought with him um, San Juana, uh, San Juana Deloa, who's going to introduce um, herself in just a moment. Um, I have a little bit of background on Chris. He is a program manager at Equality California and oversees their education programs. Prior to joining Equality California, Chris worked in the nonprofit industry consulting, community organizing, and development, uh, serving organizations and initiatives focused on education, genocide awareness and prevention, refugee issues, and LGBTQ plus mental health. He also taught high school special education in the Los Angeles Unified School District for four years. Chris holds a master's degree in actually two, two degrees in public policy and urban planning from USC and a master's in special education from Loyola Marymount and a BA in history from UC Riverside. Uh, Chris, would you like, I guess it's San Juana, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? I don't have any notes um, to do that myself. Hello everyone, um, good evening. My name is San Juana Deloa, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a program associate with Equality California. Um, I'm a native Californian, but I come to you all from Texas where I taught eighth grade English. Um, and before that I was in New York completing my bachelor's at New York University. And so I'm really excited to be back here and doing the work in my community. Um, and thank you all for having us. Thank you. So please go ahead with your presentation. I'm so happy to have you here. Yeah, thank you all for being here on a Tuesday night. Um, as Linda said, I am Chris, uh, and I'm a program manager at Equality California. Today, we're gonna to be talking about policies and sort of best practices uh, for supporting LGBTQ and all students in California Unified School Districts. We have a program called the Safe and Supportive Schools Program that consists of a survey and report providing information to folks like yourself on uh, what districts are doing. Uh, and so it's great to speak to you all. Um, just a little bit about e e Equality California. You may know this already, uh, but Equality California is a statewide LGBTQ organization. Uh, here is the mission statement. Um, really, for 21 years, Equality California has been engaged in Sacramento in passing legislation to improve the lives of LGBTQ people, in particular students. And there's been a lot of movement in particular in the last 10 years on a lot of different fronts. Um, and that is what the focus of this presentation is on. Uh, so here's what we're gonna be talking about at a glance. Uh, not gonna go too deep into the landscape because y'all know a lot of this already, um, but we will spend some time on laws and policies and some time on our school's program, which is really focused on gathering and disseminating information uh, that is often quite hard to come by. Since as we will talk about, there's a distance between, and you all know this, between what the law is and what kids experience. Um, and that distance between what the letter of the law is and how it is implemented at the district and even more so at the school and classroom level, that is what we're trying to we're trying to close that gap. So really in doing all of this work, our focus is on safe and supportive school environments. And the way that we just define that, our working definition for it, is that safe and supportive school environments are env environments in which policies and practices are put into place to support students, protect them from harassment and bullying and intimidation, and recognize their individual identities. And safe and supportive school environments are environments in which the adults who are in positions of authority 
are knowledgeable of the unique backgrounds and challenges of their students and act in a knowledgeable, empathetic, and respectful manner toward them. So there are a number of laws and best practices that exist to try to get us to the realization of that aspirational as yet definition. And here they are. Uh, so SES law from 2011 specified that schools must adopt and publicize anti-bullying policies and personnel must intervene when they witness bullying according to those policies. Fair Education Act, which happened the same year, mandated that LGBTQ contributions be included in social science curriculum. The School Success and Opportunity Act ensured equal access to school programs and facilities regardless of a student's gender identity. And part of that was that student names and dress were protected. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Uh, CHIA, the California Healthy Youth Act in 2015, mandated that school health curriculum, sexual health curriculum, be LGBTQ inclusive and comprehensive. Um, a AB 2246 required that suicide prevention policies be LGBTQ inclusive and have LGBTQ specific content. And these last two are less pertinent to this discussion since really both of them are about training. And uh, in recent years, there hasn't been really, you know, su substantial robust funding to provide those trainings. Pardon me for my dogs uh, barking. Um, Chris, Chris, can I jump in with just one quick question for you? As parents yeah. are kind of absorbing all of these laws, I'm sure some of them are, um, you know, thrilled to know that they exist. Whether or not they're actually being implemented is another question. But if I'm not mistaken, these apply only to public schools. Is that correct? Yes. Private okay. schools are an entirely different beast. Okay. Uh, so, so that that's is a good thing to keep in mind, in mind tonight as you're listening that um, Chris is, these are going to pertain to public schools only. Traditional public schools and, and charters, although there's you know, nuances there, uh, obviously. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up, Linda. Private yes. schools are, that's a separate system. Um, so number of laws on that slide, really the more, most pertinent pieces of this are these four laws and the, per, and the related education code sections. So um, most, of, most of you probably already know this, there is a book of laws that apply to the public education system in California that is called the Education Code. It's a, I mean, it's a number of thick volumes, but uh, you will find these particular laws in those sections of the Education Code. And I will make sure that this, this presentation gets sent out at the end of, uh, of this meeting so that you can have those on hand. Um, but there they are for your reference. Uh, and you can potentially reference these in conversation with an administrator or a teacher. Um, so that's that. These are tools in your toolbox. Now, practically, what do these things oh mean? So, SES uh, law means that your district must have a public anti-bullying policy, and staff are required to implement it meaning they are required to step in and protect your child or act on a bullying complaint when, once they receive it. The Fair Education Act mandates that whenever your school district adopts new American history textbooks, for example, for grades five and 11, which my understanding is that that's still when they teach US history, those textbooks must be Fair Act compliant and include content that is LGBTQ plus focused. Now, the, the key with the Fair Education Act is whenever your school district adopts new textbooks. So there's a lot of places where fair has not been implemented. And often that is because the school district has textbooks that are 10, 15, 20 years old, sadly. Uh, the School Success and Opportunity Act means that your child is entitled to use restrooms and locker rooms that accord with their gender, gender identity. 
They are also allowed to play sports and access gender specific activities that accord with their gender identity. That is their right, not a privilege. Uh, California Healthy Youth Act, whenever your school provides sex ed, the content must be LGBTQ plus inclusive. Suicide prevention in schools, your district su suicide prevention policy and training must have LGBTQ specific training. And these other two uh, laws are not um, that pertinent. I was gonna stop here and ask which of these have you heard or seen implemented in your district, but we can gloss over that for right now. But here are all of these laws at a glance and they pertain to different areas. You'll see if you look at our uh, report that we have issued that provides information on what districts are actually doing that um, th these things are, are uh, unevenly implemented across districts. Um, but big takeaways. So what, is, what are actually legally protected? Uh, so dress. Your, uh, a, a student has the right to dress in a way that accords with their gender identity. Schools and districts do have rights to have dress codes, but they must not be discriminatory on the basis of gender. Uh, names, meaning uh, a student's name, regardless of whether they have legally changed it, uh, can be updated in a system and teachers are required to use it. Uh, facility access. So a student must act, access, must be able to access bathrooms, locker rooms, uh, et cetera. Um, there are circumstances in a lot of districts where uh, that means a nurse's office restroom. That is not a, you know, a best practice by any means, um, but it is compliant with the law. Uh, extracurricular activity access, so sports, clubs, things like that. Attendance at school-sponsored events, including with a date of their choice, for, for instance, for proms, that is legally protected. Uh, speech, in the sense that a, ch a student is there, uh, are, are allowed to uh, uh, come out, obviously, and to be out at school and to be open about that in classroom discussion and forming a GSA. So just as uh, other clubs are allowed to be formed, so students have the right to form GSAs. Chris, I wanna just chime in here for parents um, with, with an observation about what I think is so fantastic. And this is, a lot of this has to do with School Success and Opportunity Act, right? Because a lot of this is pertaining to gender, right? As a therapist dealing with a lot of um, uh, families uh, who are supporting a lot of families who have children in our local school systems, when I share with the student or the parents that there is this law in place that protects them so that they can be um, expressive of their uh, gender and partake in the activities and use the locker room or the bathroom that's congruent with their gender and have an ID card that shows their name and their proper pronouns and all of these things that are protected, the, there's usually this amazement that the students and the parents didn't realize that this was possible. And so I'm just kind of wanting to really underscore how much relief that brings to the child to know that, that, the, that by law, the schools must do this, right? Um, because they, they kind of think that they're almost like pioneering that they're gonna have to go in and like explain to people why it's important, what they're gonna need. And, and they, they, they do feel this tremendous burden. So I just really, again, wanted to kind of underscore that by sharing with your, with your children that this is um, a law, we may have to go talk to the school to make sure that they're complying with the law, but that um, you know, it really normalizes uh, their experience of the child so that they don't have to feel quite so othered and so much of an outlier, right? Like, like for the kid to know that these systems are already in place, they're ready for you. They, they you know, you're welcome here. They've got this uh, already figured out for you. Um, it might be a little bumpy and there might still be some hard edges, but it, it really does 
bring down a lot of that um, kind of the stigma and the feeling of being um, so different. Um, uh, so I just want to, I'm editorializing, Chris. No, thank you for doing that. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So not legally mandated, but best practice uh, is for districts to have gender and sexuality alliances in all schools, for schools to recognize LGBTQ days of significance, for schools to have an explicit policy allowing all students to bring dates of their choice to school advances. Actually, that is legally required um, or can be, be caused for uh, legal action. Um, and for districts to have a number of LGBTQ inclusive books in school libraries, things like that. Um, but in any case, so I, I've gone through those laws and best practices pretty quickly. Does anybody have any questions on that, on any of that? We're not taking questions from the audience right now because of the recording. Okay. And I don't see anything in the chat at this point. Okay. Well, well, we'll go into the survey and report, which is the primary way that we, as an organization, are looking to provide you know, accountability and gather information on what's actually going on at the district level across this state. Um, so we have a Safe and Supportive Schools report card that has been issued once. It was issued in 2019, and we're at the front end of putting together a second report. Um, it is publicly available on a website that we have uh, that I will provide the address to in a, in a bit. Um, but it, it's, it's a based on a comprehensive survey that we have uh, that was sent to unified school districts across the state with questions on school climate, cultural competency training for teachers, transgender and gender nonconforming students, specific issues uh, associated with those students, curriculum and suicide prevention. And so in 2018 and 19, districts responded to that survey and we compiled the results and issued them in a report that provided public information on what districts were actually implementing on the ground. Some examples of the things that we asked them are here. So we asked about anti-bullying policies, about how often those policies were distributed to students and parents, about the collection of data on sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity, about dress codes, about the number of uh, staff members trained in LGBTQ cultural competency, about the processes in place for changing a transgender or gender nonconforming student's name on both official and unofficial school records, on whether LGBTQ inclusive titles were included in school libraries, on how often districts were reviewing textbooks and curriculum materials, on uh, whether suicide prevention policies were LGBTQ inclusive. And the reason why we collected this information was because really to date and still to, to a, a, an unfortunately a large extent, there is great variability depending upon where you live and where your kid goes to school as to what they are actually experiencing in school. Um, districts, are not implementing certain laws and they are not implementing certain best practices. Now, some are well ahead of the curve and some are far behind and there's a great amount of variation in between. Uh, so we want to see which districts are doing exceptionally well, which districts are not doing so well, and hopefully then provide accountability. Uh, both by working with those districts that need to improve and by providing information that parents can use, parents and community advocates can use, uh, both in conversation and in potential litigation, to be completely honest with you. Uh, so I think this is where I'm going to pass it over to San Juana. 
Thank you, Chris. All right, so now um, we're going to go into the report background and the goals of the safe and supportive schools report card. Um, so we have a lot of different goals. One is to provide an easy consolidated checklist of laws and best practices for district staff, as opposed to separate state, county, and district memos and policy papers. So you have all of these laws in one report uh, to provide a time and space for districts to reflect on their progress as relates to safe and supportive schools and make improvements as a result to engage districts in conversations focused on improvement to better serve LGBTQ plus youth, assess and make public the efforts of districts to implement laws and develop programs and evaluate progress, chart course for improvement and foster collaborative relationships with the districts. So the real purpose, what we hope to guide the districts through this process of self-evaluation and reflection is to recognize the existing strengths. So which of these laws are they already implementing? How are they serving an, as an example for other districts? Uh, identifying areas of growth. Where can we help them identify some of the areas where they might not be um, necessarily complying? Uh, making plans for improvement, identifying resources, and connecting different districts so that they can share learnings and offer suggestions, uh, and equipping students, parents, and the community advocates with information that can guide their efforts to engage with superintendents and other policymakers. So as Chris mentioned before, there are five different sections in the survey. We have school climate, cultural competen competency training for teachers and staff, transgender and gender nonconforming students, curriculum, and suicide prevention. So uh, district engagement. Um, we are targeting all of the California Unified School Districts. Um, so as you all mentioned before, we are not uh, looking at charter schools. We're not looking at private schools or even uh, unified districts of like high schools or middle schools. We're just looking at the unified school districts and that's 343 districts. This was mailed out in November of 2017 and 130 districts responded and that was 38% of all unified school districts in California. And if I could just pause here, that, 100, that sample of 130, included Manhattan Beach Unified, Los Angeles Unified. Um, so those of you who have uh, children in, in public schools in Manhattan Beach uh, and in Los, you know, Los Angeles can look and see how they responded to the survey. Now, the data is now three years old. We will be providing new data and hopefully, well, Los Angeles Unified will respond hopefully Manhattan Beach Unified will respond and a number of other districts so that you can see those results when we publish them in 2022. I don't think Redondo responded. Uh, I don't recall if Torrance Unified, some of our, our reach really is here in the South Bay beyond Manhattan Beach. Um, but you can go online, Chris, the email ad or the web address and look up your district if, it, if it's outside of Manhattan Beach and see if they responded. Uh, so just a quick overview, uh, these are the districts by tier. So there were 22 spotlight districts, 80 foundational districts, and 28 priority districts. So 22 districts in the spotlight tier, uh, top tier, represent regions across California, including the Central Valley, Bay Area, Inland Empire, Orange County, San Diego County, and more. Uh, 80 districts in the foundational middle tier, and of course, 28 in the priority lower tier um, and then just want to highlight the language. Um, we don't necessarily want to shame districts that responded but might not have done um, super well in the report. Uh, we also want to acknowledge some of the limitations. Uh, so Unified School Districts self-reported, many differ from the actual student experiences uh, capacity. Only Unified School Districts are included. Um, and then policies versus the implementation slash enforcement. Again, recognizing that these surveys are filled out by someone at the district level um, and aren't always capturing student experiences. 
And then here's a heat map of the responding school districts. Um, as you can see, centered around the San Francisco, Sacramento area, and then down here in the Los Angeles region. Uh, so school climate and cultural competency, comp excuse me, school climate and cultural competency, competency training. We have 130 districts and out of those, the 130 districts have an existing anti-bullying policy prohibiting discrimination, harassment, intimidation, and bullying against students. For the section transgender and gender non-conforming students, 62 out of the 130 districts have an established process for changing a transgender or gender non-conforming student's name and gender for purposes of official school records or databases. And then um, again, transgender and gender non-conforming students, 113 out of the 130 responding districts reported all district schools allow students to use all restrooms and or locker rooms that correspond to students' gender identity. So if I, I just interject right there. So as, as we've established, this is a law. And so yeah. even, even among the, you, you know, the districts that responded to this survey, there were districts that indicated that they were not compliant with the law. Now, what that means is either they're brazenly, you know, uh, indicating that they are acting in, uh, in non-compliance with the law, or they don't know about it. <laughs> so, uh, I, and I'm more inclined to think it's, it's the latter, right? Uh, in most places, it is because, certain, you know, people don't know it's a law, they don't have they haven't been told that they should be doing a certain uh, thing when when they in fact should be. So this is an ongoing area where we are trying to do more to inform districts where they what they need to be doing. And this is also an opportunity for parents and for community members to really, you know, in, instruct a district um, because honestly, the state sometimes does not do such a great job of guiding districts to be compliant with these laws. <laughs> so, so one of the questions, Chris, is about um, from, from parents is how can they help get districts to respond? Uh, could they email certain people asking them to participate in the next uh, round? We'll talk about that in just a, just a bit. I don't want to put oh, the, the cart before the horse. Um, but yeah, so uh, sorry, Sam, Wanda, you can continue. No worries, we're all excited about this survey. Um, so another highlight um, was in the curriculum and suicide prevention area, 38 out of 130 districts reported that they require specific LGBTQ inclusive titles to be included in their school's libraries for one or more grade category. And so it's relatively low. Uh, and then 118 out of 130 districts reported that student participation in sexual health and HIV prevention education is mandatory, barring affirmative opt-out by a parent or guardian. 105 out of 130 districts have, an established, have established a suicide awareness and prevention training program. And so next steps slash expanding to more districts. Um, so as we've already mentioned, 130 districts responded to the last survey. 108 scored either priority or foundational. So there is significant room for growth. 216 districts did not respond to the survey. Uh, and these include most of the rural districts in the state, many of the suburban ones, and most of the districts in Orange County, and in the Inland Empire, the Central Valley, Central Coast, far Northern and interior parts of the state. And the second survey is being sent out in November and we want at least 200 districts to participate this time. So here we have a list of non-responsive school districts. 
um, we've separated them out by the different parts of California. So Inland Empire, Los Angeles, Central Coast. As you can see in Los Angeles County and Orange County, we have a significant amount of districts that did not respond to the survey. Um, and then... So here, yeah. oh, sorry to interject, someone. Here, pertinent districts are Redondo and Palos Verdes Peninsula, neither of which responded. Um, and yeah, help would be appreciated on those fronts. <laughs> so uh, Chris mentioned before that there is a, a website that you could all go to to see the last survey. Um, and it's this interactive website. You could go to savesupportofschools.org. Um, you'll be able to find your district, uh, see whether or not they responded, um, and then how they did on the report card. And then you'll be able to see how they did on these separate categories, school climate, transgender and gender nonconforming curriculum, and so on. Um, you're more than welcome to go to the website and explore the website for yourself. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. And that's it. Um, so I, I, I saw some questions in the chat. I don't know whether we want to go to those, but what, one thing that, so at, we will provide this presentation and also um, contact information for our two uh, districts that we're looking at, for Redondo and for Palos Verdes Peninsula, along with a draft email that you can repurpose uh, for use in contacting the superintendent's office. Um, so uh, yeah, I will provide that in the follow-up email that I will send to, uh, to Linda. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Good. Um, you see a couple questions here. Um, curious about what might be done in the upcoming survey to reflect student experiences. Well, so this survey is is very specific. Um, I really, uh, there are a number of organizations that do excellent student surveys. Uh, GLSEN, it, it may be the, the, the one that has the most well-established methodologically sound survey. Really the purpose of, of this particular survey is just looking at the district level and the policies that districts have in place. We do think that it is important that the district have a policy that is reflect have policies that is reflective of state one of state law and two of best practices, and there's that massive gap. So there are two, there are I suppose three gaps that we're looking at in in uh, the support of LGBTQ students. There's the gap between the state and the district, which is what we sort of fill, and then there's the gap between the district and the school. And then there's the gap between the school and the classroom. Now, what individual teachers do is to a certain extent, that's difficult to control. Uh, all it really just takes is, is one person for, for good or ill. Um, but we think that really for districts, for, they should set the tone really. And um, that's what we're about is collecting that information on district policies. Um, we work a lot in uh, having conversations with districts, providing them model policies, providing them contacts to organizations that can, for example, uh, put um, free LGBTQ inclusive books in their school libraries and things like that. Um, and, and that is sort of our niche is working with those districts. Uh, but for sure, there are limitations and there are a number of, if you're interested in student experiences and survey efforts that are oriented around gathering information on that, GLSEN would be a good place to start. And that's G-L-S-E-N, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. So another question um, is about whether you've talked to any districts that didn't respond to see if they had reasons, such as maybe not having the consolidated data or thinking the survey was too long, or maybe they thought it wasn't important. What, is, what seems to be, maybe the question really is, what seems to be the most common reason why people, why districts are not responding? 
So all of those, that was a very, a very perceptive comment. Yeah, there is the time commitment. There is a lack of uh, knowledge of who we are and why it's our business to have district data. Um, there is hesitancy to make this public out of fear of legal exposure on occasion. Um, and sometimes, although I think this is maybe the least common reason, sometimes there is just opposition to these laws. <laughs> um, but that's not usually, at least this is my sense, that's not usually the case. But we've had a number of conversations with districts that didn't respond. We've mm -hmm. prioritized it. Um, and more often than not, it is, we didn't know what this was. We didn't know who you were. It was sent to, to a person who didn't have the information to respond, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very rarely is it, you know, a district with a, uh, you know, that is actively trying to not be compliant with state law. <laughs> right, right. And I remember um, speaking with some folks at the Dondo Union when the when it came that we learned they had not responded. And there, I think, I forget what was going on in the, either the general area or the district in particular, but there were multi, maybe budget cuts, there were multiple very dense and weighty administrative decisions and tasks that were also on the table. And they just couldn't get to the report card. They just had their plates full. Um, so I guess that's also maybe the reason why sometimes they don't get to it. Um, that still isn't satisfying, but um, one question here, and I and I um, want to just clarify. I want to um, make sure we air this because the uh, participant asked it, and I don't I don't think it's so. But they were asking to clarify: Is it required that a school survey students' gender identity and sexual identity? That no the question. No, not at all. And in fact, there are a lot of districts that are very hesitant because of the, out of, out of privacy concerns. That is, uh, we ask whether districts collect SOGI data because it's more of an informational, information collection question. We wanna see if anybody is doing that. Um, but there is, there's a lot of um, sort of debate on that point within sc school districts on whether it's a good idea or not. Because on the one hand, having this data lets you know, you know, is how many students are actually LGBTQ so that you can direct relevant resources. But then on the other hand, this is really sensitive data, especially when you're, uh, you're talking about minors. You don't want to collect things that might be, you know, made public or uh, compromise a kid's safety. Um, so it's more, uh, uh, something that we are interested to know whether there are districts that are doing that. Right, well, and isn't the Healthy Kids Survey the one that um, I know local districts here implement and that does go out to students and that there are questions about sexual orientation and gender identity that the students can answer if they wish. Um, but what we find in, in most of the um, measurement tools that are out there is that the LGBTQ community is very much often underrepresented because people are hesitant to raise their hand and be counted um, for all kinds of various reasons. So um, yeah, just to clarify, your survey does not survey the students themselves about sexual orientation, gender identity, um, but the schools may have other measures that they use to do so. Here we go. One more question. Um, as for libraries having books with LGBTQ themes, do you have a list of books that you would recommend? It might be easier to get the library on board if you could make specific requests. I'm, I'm not an expert on sort of, L, L, I'm, I'm, one, I'm not a librarian. And two, uh, <laughs> I don't want to step on any librarian's toes. 
Uh, what I, uh, in the past, what I have done is refer uh, school districts, and, and you can find this information publicly on their website, to an organization called Gender Nation. Now, they focus primarily, they, uh, entirely on elementary school, um, but they have a list, and it's a good list of, uh, they have this sort of standard kit that they send out to uh, elementary school libraries in various districts. They've done it to all, I think they're in the process of doing it with all of the schools in LAUSD, uh, potentially Fresno Unified as well. It's like 12 titles of elementary school books that it, you, and you can see it on their website. Um, but the organization again is called Gender Nation. Uh, there are, uh, there's not, as far as I know, a similar organization that does it with middle and high school uh, books. Um, but uh, there are a number of titles out there uh, and potentially you, I, I, mean, I would probably refer to your, your librarian. Well, our, our, our local librarian, um, Allie Wood, has offered in the, in the chat that we do have a great list of resource books on our PFLAG Manhattanbeach.org website in the resources tab. So we've been accumulating those books for um, families and I think we've organized them by age. And so feel free not to really that. a librarian though, just so I, right, right, right. I'm so yeah, please. <laughs> I'm not a legitimate that, librarian. I just have an was, interest. That was just another one of your capabilities. I want to make sure you got credit for it. Anybody else last any last questions you want to jot into the chat? Looks like we're maybe um, got our answers. And so I want to thank you again, Chris and San Juana, for being here tonight and for sharing this important information about what's happening, what's happening to um, what Equality California is doing to help make the school safer for our kids and enlighten us as to what we can do as local activists and parents of our loved ones to get the, our, our, our school districts on board and to um, uh, share with our kids the fact that there are these laws that protect them. Um, so really it's you've, been, you've illuminated a lot of really wonderful things that are going on out there. And we really appreciate you coming to join us tonight. Yeah, thank you all for having us. Um, and as I said, uh, we'll circulate this presentation uh, contacts for the two districts that we're concerned with and a draft email that you can use in reaching out to them. But uh, really grateful for the opportunity and uh, thank you for all that you are doing um, in Manhattan Beach and the South Bay. And uh, we're, we're grateful to have you as partners. Yes, we're happy to be your partner.